My name is Cody Thaller. I am currently a uh, subject matter expert for the Full Stack Web Development Program here um, at Kenzie Academy. Uh, I've been working here for just about a year now. Um, and I have been in the software game for four or five years now. Um, I have a bachelor's in computer engineering. Um, and then after graduating, I ended up going to a programming boot camp similar to Kenzie Academy. It wasn't Kenzie Academy um, because I was interested in more of the applicable skills. I felt like getting my my bachelor's uh, helped me get a good foundational understanding, but I didn't really know how to apply a lot of it. Uh, so I went to a boot camp myself and got a job as a developer uh, and then came back into the educational world where I've been teaching for a few years now. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And today we're going to talk about APIs and more specifically web APIs. So we can go to the next slide. So before we can even get into what is a web API, we kind of need to understand what an API is. API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it's essentially a way for two different computer programs to talk to each other. Um, we call this a, a, a programming interface because generally you have one program that needs some information and it will get the information or it needs to process some data and you know we don't reinvent the wheel every time we need to build a new car we use a process where a lot of the stuff is pre-configured and we put it into use so that's where these apis come in uh we can go to the next one now a web api is specifically a program that your program will interface with over the network over the internet um this is where we can have a web page that will retrieve data. You know, think about times that you've gone to some website and it showed a Google map, even though you're not on a Google Maps website. That's an, a web API that's in use. Um, and it's when we just have a web page or a mobile application, which we call the client, right? The client, not as in the client at a customer relationship kind of deal, but the client is the device and the application that the user is interacting with directly. Um, so a web API is when we have a web page or mobile app or some kind of client application that is communicating with a server across the internet. Next slide. So what do they quote unquote talk about, right? Um, again, a lot of times we introduce and incorporate APIs into our applications because we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes it's just a matter of, there's a lot of data that would need to be configured into our own application, but somebody else has it publicly available through an API. So it makes more sense to utilize some other resource and do something like retrieve data, uh, send data to the server, for storage, you know, um, you have good, you, there's the whole Google Drive um, ecosystem. There's an API that you can use to send data to a Google Drive somewhere, right? Um, or just even asking a server to do a job. Um, sometimes it's not that I, you know, we as developers are trying to retrieve information. Sometimes it's just that we're you know, not necessarily, maybe we're working with a, a relatively weak device on the client side, and we need to do some kind of intense calculations or something like that. Uh, you'll see this you could, probably going to come up a lot more with the recent boom in artificial intelligence, where a lot of that takes more processing power than your phone or device is probably capable of. Um, and it will ask some other application to do the dirty work for them. You can go to the next slide. So let's look at just a super basic diagram here. This comes from uh, a blog written by a developer over at Uber to kind of describe what's going on with specifically a web API. Um, you have a user that is on their client application. And in this little analogy, the user that's, you know, sitting at their computer, sitting on their phone is a person that's at a restaurant. And 
in the back of the back of the house, you have a kitchen where all the food and stuff is. Um, and the user is not going to go back there and make the food themselves. There's some wait staff that's going to come by and say, hey, you know, would you like to make a request for some food? And the user says, yes, I will take one lasagna, please. And so the wait staff says, excellent choice. I'm going to go back and pass along that request. And they take it to the back of the house and they pass that request on to the kitchen staff and the kitchen staff will do the job. They will create the meal out of the food and then they will send it back to the, the client, the user, the customer that's sitting at the table with the prepared food. That's the general idea of what we're doing when we're interacting with web APIs. We have a user that is doing something that's triggering a request and a request is sent over the internet to a server. The server will process the request, gather the resources that are being requested and send them back as a response. Specifically, these requests and responses that we're talking about are HTTP requests and responses, which is the standard protocol for retrieving data and navigating all over the internet. Let's go to the next slide. So let's kind of walk through a couple examples of API interactions. We have a client, and then there's the cloud, the network, the internet, the, the great myth, mythical, mystical Wow. what's going on of the internet. And then there's a server somewhere in a warehouse that's run by Amazon or Microsoft or some guy's basement. I don't know. There's a server somewhere. Let's go to the next one. So the client, the person that's using the client application says, I want to see all the shoes that are available for purchase. Let's go next. And the server responds with the list of all the shoes. There was an API call is what we call it. When we're making a request to a web API, we are calling the API for some information. In this case, the client, the user that's sitting on their laptop trying to do some clothes shopping said, hey, what, what shoes are available? And then the shoes got to their, their screen. Let's go next. What about not a computer. You know, we, we talked about how the client can be running on a cell phone, a smartphone. Nowadays, they have like fridges that you can tweet from, which is wild still. Like, why? I don't know, but whatever. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this person on their phone wants, they get the little notification that says, hey, this uh, you're, you're running low on space. You can't download the latest uh, meme app thing or whatever. I don't know. Um, so the client, the, the user starts going through the pictures and they've got a subscription to something like Google photos. And they say, okay, well, let me just take all these photos, these pictures that I have on my phone and store them elsewhere. So they use some, some kind of application and send a request to the server saying, Hey, go ahead, do me a favor, store this photo for me. Next slide. And then the server sends back confirmation saying, cool, we're good. I've got it. I have your pictures now. And then later on, the user can make another API call to retrieve those images. Let's go to the next slide. The client is a car. Crazy, right? But nowadays, like everything has an internet connection, it seems like. It's called the internet of things, but that's a whole other topic for a whole other course at a whole other day. Let's go to the next slide. So the user is driving around in their car and they're, they see a little bit of traffic maybe, or they realize, oh, I'm driving across town and it's, it's 4.45, it's almost rush hour. Uh, so they pull up, they, they got the big fancy screen on their, on their car and they tap around and, and they, they do something that effectively sends a request to the server, to an API and says, hey, give me traffic conditions for my drive home. Next slide. And then the server responds with data that is then put into a map on the screen so that the driver can see, ooh, that main road is super congested right now. Let me take some back roads. 
all of these different interactions that we've talked about here, all of these different things are powered by APIs. Let's go to the next slide. So what kinds of web APIs are there? Well, there's a ton of different categories. There are map APIs. There are photo APIs. You know, these are some of the examples that we've seen. There's APIs that give you government data. There's APIs that you can interact with to get news. You know, what's the breaking news story? There are full-on recipe APIs. Um, and then as of more recently, people have created APIs to get all kinds of COVID data. Let's go to the next slide. But who... Who makes these things? Well, a lot of these APIs come from companies that you're used to, that you've heard of, that you use daily. Wikipedia, there are AP, there's a Wikipedia API that you can use to get information on a topic. YouTube, uh, think about all any time that you've been on a website that is not YouTube, and there's been a YouTube video embedded on there. That video was retrieved by making an API request. It's not that somebody coded all of YouTube or the you know everything needed to make YouTube work in their application. They sent an API request to get a YouTube encoded, you know, a, a YouTube specifically designed player with the information needed to get the video. Twitter, you see tweets embedded in another in a, in a news article there's a Twitter API, they're sending a request and getting a tweet. Uh, Facebook, same deal. You see the little Facebook buttons all over the place. You see, you know, snippets of a Facebook page and it's not just a picture. There's a Facebook API. You can, you can also use Facebook to log into things. Um, New York Times, you want to get some New York, some, some newspaper articles. Marvel, you want to get information about superheroes. There's so many different categories of APIs from so many different companies. Let's go to the next. And some of them are just people that that really really like things. Uh, there's a jokes API where you can just send it send a request and get a random joke. You can get a specific joke. Uh, you can use APIs for Dungeons and Dragons stuff. You can use uh, APIs to you know there's an API made for Jeopardy. And as we're gonna see very very shortly. Pokemon API. We can get information about all of the Pokemon. All right, let's go to the next. So that's what we're going to do right now is I'm going to take control of the screen and I'm going to show you how you would go about getting information from an API. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So just a little bit of background here. I mentioned that there is a Pokemon API, pokeapi.co. This is an API that's just developed by fans of Pokemon. It's that simple. And what this API allows you to do is, well, you can fetch information about any Pokemon. So here they give you an example. There is a URL, HTTPS colon slash slash pokeapi.co slash API slash v2 slash Pokemon slash ditto. And by sending that request, you see here is a little preview window that contains all of the information that you'll get back. Now, we're specifically talking about web APIs today. So all of our API calls are going to be done over the internet. And how do you access something on the internet? We have a URL. So what we're going to do is we're going to build out a little web page that's going to be a Pokedex. We're going to be able to browse through all the Pokemon and see information about them. And why why is this such a useful thing? Well, let me let me let me just do something here for you. Pokeapi.co slash API slash v2 slash Pokemon. If I send a request to this URL, it's going to give me information on all of the Pokemon. This right here, count 1,279. Not sure if you've kept up with Pokemon, but it is no longer 151 to catch them all. It is now 1,279 to catch them all. And what we're going to see, and what you can see here, is that each one of these Pokemon has quite a lot 
of information attached to it. An absurd amount of information attached to it. And if there's 1,279 of them, and each one of them has potentially this much or more information, we definitely don't want to create all of that ourselves, right? Why reinvent the wheel? That's one of the driving forces behind API's existence. So I'm going to use uh, CodePen, which is a great little resource. Let me just name this. Uh, Kenzie Academy, Pokey API demo. Um, CodePen is a great site. It is a great resource that you can build little basic web pages and websites to try and, you know, test things out. In fact, I'm going to drop a link in chat right now. If you go to that link and periodically refresh, you will actually be able to see everything that I'm doing, and this will persist after the demo is over, and you'll be able to use this. You'll be able to play around with it and, and see some cool stuff. Um, but this is more in the realm of web development rather than you know your, your traditional software development or cybersecurity. So that's why I'm using these tools. I'm using HTML to design to, to, to structure the content on the page. CSS is how we're making it look nice. And then JavaScript is where all of the real dirty work is going to be. This is where we're going to write some code that will make a request to the API, get the data, and put it on the screen. On my actual little page, I don't have anything visible. I have a, a, a little container element that has what is going to be an unordered list to show the Pokemon. And then I have a separate little section where I'll be able to focus on a single Pokemon. And all of the data you'll see here, none of the data that we're gonna be dealing with is anywhere on this page. It is nowhere to be found because it's gonna come from somewhere else. So let's start with populating the Pokedex. This URL that I sent a request to, am I sharing the code, code pen screen? I think so. Am I not? It says I'm screen sharing. Y'all could see this, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Um, so I have the, the Pokedex and the, the, the URL that I sent the request to before is going to get me, at the very least, the first 20 Pokemon. In JavaScript, we can send HTTP requests through a built-in function called fetch. And fetch accepts one, what we call an argument. I want to pass something into this function, which because fetch is meant to send an HTTP request to a URL, what we're going to pass in is a URL. Uh, can I show Axios too? Axios is something that I need to import. And so I'm going to kind of, I'm trying to keep it as, as simplified as, as we can, just because we have the limited time frame and all that. If we wrap up and everything goes smoothly, I might be able to squeeze it in. Um, but I can't make any promises. So um, I need to pass the URL in between these little parentheses. And I'm going to do it as a string. And I'm just going to paste that in. Now, fetch is what we call an asynchronous function. Code runs one line after the other sequentially. But sometimes there is no cut and dry way to know how much time is it going to take for this line of code to finish running. When I have a line of code that looks something like let x equals 10, where I'm defined, declaring a variable and assigning it a value of 10, and I say x equals x plus 5, well, JavaScript knows that it's done with this line of code because it has finished doing the mathematical operation and assigned the new value to x. But when I send a request to a URL, first of all, JavaScript doesn't know how long it's going to take to get a response back, or even if it ever will get a response back. So because of that, this is built as an asynchronous function that returns what is called a promise. And just like in real life, you can keep a promise or you can break a promise. 
if I keep the promise, then I want to do something. But if the promise is broken, then I'm going to catch some sad feelings and, and deal with them. Inside of the dot then or the dot catch, I want to create what is called a callback function, which is just saying when either we get a good response or a bad response, how should we handle it? What function should run with that information? Dot then, I'm going to say that I'm going to take my response. And this arrow is a type of function. It's called an arrow function. My parameter response is going to be whatever comes back. And the function I'm going to run is to take that response and convert it to JSON. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. HTTP requests is full of what are essentially just long strings of text. So I can use this method that comes from the response to convert all of that text into an object or set of objects or an array of objects that I can actually use within my code. That is also asynchronous. So I then need to do something else. And what we'll do is we'll just start with console logging that data. If we get some kind of error, then I'm also just gonna console log the error for now. I'm not gonna uh, worry too much about catching the error at this time. So when I first load up my quote unquote page, this API call is made. And if we open our uh, developer browser or our developer tools, we will see that an API call was made and the response came back. And this looks very similar to this. We have a count, a next, and then an array with a bunch of objects. Count. Next, there's a previous that's null and an array with a bunch of objects. So this whole object is data. So I'm going to take data.results and I'm going to use some JavaScript to put some list items inside of this list and have it appear on the page. So let's do a couple things. I am probably going to end up needing to run this function several times. So I'm going to create my own function called uh, fetch, or I'll call it catch them all. And it is going to accept a URL as a parameter. Now I can call catch them all and pass this in and make this take the URL. And this will allow me to reuse this function anytime. Let me turn off my little React dev tools. Apparently this is made with React, which is interesting. There we go. Okay. Um, by creating my own function that will make the API call, this will get the data or it will send a request to the URL that I provide, which I provide right here. Then it will take the response and convert it to JSON. And currently it's just console logging it. But what I want to do is a couple of things. One, I want to take the results and put them here. So I'm going to make another function called populate list, populate Pokedex. And it's going to accept an array of Pokemon, Poke R, now we're pirates. <laughs> and I will, for each object in there, put a list item here. Uh, Rob, I don't know why that might, that that's happening. You may need to leave and come back, perhaps. Uh, it sounds like it's just frozen because that's that's that was the uh, the old screen share, um, yeah. So I have my array of Pokemon, and I can just prove it. Console log it, and I will call populate Pokedex with data dot results. So refresh my page, call catch them all. There's my results that are being printed here. So I'm gonna 
in for each one of these, create a list item. So I'm going to use a what is called a higher order function called map. That will take each object and it will return. Well, I need to create a list item. Document dot create element li li dot inner text equals. And then for now, I'm just going to put the Pokemon's name. Object dot name. So each thing is going to return that list item. Um, and then I will say, let's, uh, all items equals this. I'm going to target this element. Document dot get element by ID Pokedex. And then dex dot append all items. Okay, so that didn't quite work too well. Object HTML element. But in an array. So let's see. Uh, if I can I spread that? Will that work? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, do, 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 do. Create element list item. So we've got that. If I... Okay, so let me do something here. I'm going to get rid of these. There we go. Okay, so we now have a list of 20 Pokemon. Um, and I can get even fancier and find a way to add a next and a previous button so that I can get the next 20 Pokemon or the previous 20 Pokemon. And so what I will do is I will create a a division in my HTML, a div with an ID of next prev. And every time that I get a response back, I will not just populate the Pokedex, but we'll see that the data also includes a URL for how to get the next 20 Pokemon and or the previous 20 Pokemon. I got the first 20, so there is no previous 20, but I can get the next 20. So let's do this. I'm going to make another function called generate next prev buttons. Next and prev. Prev equals, uh, I'm going to make it a let prev and next, and I'll say if next, then next equals document dot create element button, next dot inner text equals next, and then we'll start with that. Take that. If it's not, if there is no next 20, then next is going to be a just a span, which is just some text. But either way, the text inside is going to say next. And I'm going to do the same thing for the previous. If prev, prev equals document dot create element button else prev equals document dot create element span and either way prev dot inner text equals prev so i've got these two buttons now i'm going to target this element and put them next to each other uh, const next prev equals document dot get element by id next prev and next prev dot append next comma or previous first and then next. Okay. 
So what is not happy? Trev has already been declared. Oh, doy. Um, I'll call it N and P. There we go. So now we should have. All right, we're going to need to call generate next prev pass data dot next and data dot prev into that. And we'll see where we should. No, we're not. We're not seeing generate next prev is not defined. Ah, next prep buttons. Forgetting what I'm calling my own functions. There we go. So now I have a previous and a next. That's good. Um, and I'm going to make it so that when I click on next, it will then get the next 20. So um, I am also going to attach an event listener to the buttons as they're generated. So if the previous button is there, then I'm going to take that button and add an event listener. It is going to be listening for a click. And when it hears a click, it's going to run a function that is going to, um, well, we're going to call catch them all with these values. It is going to be a, a URL. So if I pass P in there, when I click on previous, when it's a button, it should get the previous 20. And then when I do the same with the next button, catch them all with N. So let's test it. Oh, oh. It got the next 20, but what I should probably do is clear these elements first. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to target next prev first because I don't want to have a ton of different prev next, prev next, prev next, um, and set the inner HTML to nothing. And I'm going to do the same here with my Pokedex when I populate the Pokedex. Dex.innerHTML equals an empty string. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. That should be a semicolon, not a colon. Same there. Okay, so now click next. Boom, next 20, next 20, next 20. Oh, previous is not working because it is not data.prev, but data.previous. And then I probably want that button to actually say the word previous instead. Next, there we go. Now I can keep going to the next, po next set of Pokemon or go back to the previous 20 Pokemon. Beautiful. So, we have sent an API request to get a bunch of Pokemon, and we've built out a little application that we can do that effectively however many times we want. We can keep getting more Pokemon, get the next 20, get the next 20, or the previous 20 and the previous 20. JavaScript and CSS are so different. Oh, yeah, they're not, they're not even almost a little similar. Uh, the, the only similarity is that there's some semicolons, there's some curly braces, and then there's words. That's about it. But they do work hand in hand. They do work hand in hand with HTML. All right. Um, so the next thing that I want to do is add one more level of API awesomeness and make it so that each one will have a little button that says show info. And when I click on it, it will show more detailed information about each one of those, about the Pokemon that I click on right here. So I'm going to have to have another function that is going to be for just catching one Pokemon. 
And it's also going to accept a URL and it's going to fetch that URL and then take the response, convert it to JSON. And then take that data and well, we're going to have to see what that data is before we make any decisions. Okay, so when we also, when we populate the Pokedex, each of these list items is also going to have a button. That has some text that says show info. I'll say info. Um, and I'm going to add an event listener. That when I click, I should call catch one Pokemon. With, let's see object.url okay and then i need to take that button and attach it to the list item perfect I got Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, and if I click on one of these things, well, what's happening? Sort of nothing. Uh, I saw a question, is CodePen my preferred editor? No, it's just much easier to use for these kinds of demos so that everybody can, you know, play along as we go. Uh, but I use Visual Studio Code. That is my my choice. Okay, so catch one Pokemon, are we not? Okay, let's console log the data that we get back. There we go, okay, so we did get something back. And that's a lot more information, right? Before we just had an array that came with a name and a URL, and now we have abilities and forms and all these different things. So we had a function to populate the Pokedex. I'm gonna make a function now called display Pokemon or display one. And it will accept a, a PKMN, a Pokemon. So if we console log the PKMN and we display one Pokemon with that data, There we go. So we can, we'll get the name. We will get a picture of it. So in sprites, other official artwork front default, we'll use that picture. We'll show the name of the Pokemon. We can show the types of the Pokemon and we'll start there. And that will probably take us to the end. Um, so I'm going to target my entry div, which I created just for this. Document.get element by ID entry. And we'll start by, let's see. I'm gonna add a, a header, a heading to it with the Pokemon's name. So const, uh, mon name equals document dot get or document dot create element i'll do an h3 i should probably just go with an h2 um mon name dot inner text equals pkmn dot name and then dex entry dot append mon name Okay, so if I click on Bulbasaur, did I not do something with it? I missed something, right? I missed something. 
Display one Pokemon. Ah, but I did not. No. Oh, oh, I did it a whole bunch. Okay, so uh, dex entry dot inner HTML equals an empty string. And then I want these things to be side by side. And then I'll, that I'll have to use some CSS for. So I've got my next prev in my Pokedex. Let's put that in a div. And then I have my entry. So I'm going to say my container is going to have a display of flex. My Pokedex has a width of 50%. Um, no, class equals dex container. So I'm going to say that my dex container is going to have that width. There we go. And then if I click info, there we go. Now we got Bulbasaur right there. Perfect. Um, and then we'll just toss a couple of extra pieces of information on the screen and call it a day. Um, I did want to show that picture. So that's what I'm going to end up doing. Um, in my display one Pokemon, I am going to create the picture itself. Mon image equals document dot create element IMG image.source is equal to, and then it was pkmn.sprites.other.official underscore, it might be official dash artwork. So I need a string front default. And then um, buh, 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 dex entry dot append mon img, which is what these should be. There we go. We got Bulbasaur. We got Blastoise. We got Butterfree, Pidgeotto, all of them. Any Pokemon that we want, we can get because we use an API. If I told you, build out an application that will display all 1,279 Pokemon and you have less than an hour, you probably would have laughed in my face and told me to, you know, do you know what with myself. <laughs> but with the power of APIs, we got it done in like 30. So that's why we use APIs. I mean, not literally because we want to catch them all, or maybe we do. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Um, but it cuts down on the amount of work that we need to do. And if there's one thing I know about developers is that the best developers are the laziest developers. We don't want to do a lot of data entry. We want to get it as efficiently as possible. And this is how you do that. So that is our basic rundown on web APIs. I'm going to end the little demo there. Again, we have the, uh, the actual code pen. I'm going to drop that link one more time so you can... Use it, play with it, edit it to your heart's content, have fun. And I'm going to open the floor to questions. I see we have some Q&A questions already. Um, do, 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 do. So I saw Duren had asked, how can we use an API to fetch data from a database, like a person's profile? Well, basically that's it right there. It obviously it depends on the API. Every API is going to have slightly different rules. Sometimes APIs are going to require you to pay for it. Um, but ultimately, what you need to do is you need to find that API's documentation and then go from there. Um, I saw somebody had just asked. Well, I'll, I'll get to the question that was just asked in a sec. Uh, let's see who is next. Which is a better way to handle requests, fetch, then catch, or async await? It depends. It depends on a number of things. Um, if you have sequential asynchronous function calls that require the results of the previous ones, then it makes more sense to use async await. If it's something super simple, like what I just did, fetch then catch, I, I think it's just easier to use. Um, 
but again, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 a, a lot of it depends on what else needs to be done. If it's just a simple, get the result and do something with it. I think that the promise syntax there with the fetch, with the then and catch is a little bit easier. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a situational thing. Um, and then I saw somebody else had asked, what does the next prev code do? Um, so if you go look at that, at the, at the link, there are two little pieces of text at the top of that, the, the page that was generated. One says previous and one says next, the next button and the previous button will get the next 20 or the previous 20 Pokemon because I attached an event listener to each of them that says, Hey, make a new API call, get the information and put it on the page and replace what's already here. So that's what that is for. Um, I also saw a question. Uh, Khadija asked, where can you, where do you find APIs? Google. Uh, I go on, go on Google and look up API for whatever it is that you need. There's also a whole like API marketplace called rapid API. Um, there are some free ones there, but you search for a topic and it'll show you all of the available APIs that have been registered to that marketplace. Um, sometimes you have to pay for it. Sometimes you have to pay per call. Sometimes it's just like a monthly subscription and it all depends. Um, but rapid API is a great resource that you can use to find all kinds of APIs that are available. Um, you can just look it up on, on your, on your, uh, uh, search engine of choice. You know, if you have a specific thing that you want to make, just look up API for X, Y, or Z, and you'll probably find some stuff. Um, are APIs at the heart of microservices? I mean, APIs are at the heart of just about everything. Uh, in fact, we were just talking about asynchronous calls. Uh, in JavaScript, at least at least in when you're built, designing server-side JavaScript, uh, the way that asynchronous code is handled is that there is actually a C++ API that Node uses and passes some instructions off to. So... APIs are at the heart of all kinds of different things. Uh, if you ever play video games, DirectX is a, a graphics API that takes information that doesn't really show much and converts it to graphical information. Um, Eleni asked, what is a REST API? Ah, that's a great question. So a REST API, REST stands for represent representational state transfer. And a REST API is a web API that follows a specific structure. Um, there are, uh, there are, I think it's six or seven different architectural standards that need to be met for something to be considered a REST API. Um, but the, the kind of simplified, most common standard that is adhered to is, uh, what we call RESTful routing, where each collection of resources is categorized in a predictable route scheme. So if you had users and you had an API to fetch users, you you would access your users through some URL slash API slash users. And that would, as a get request, get you all of them. As a post request to slash API slash users, it would create a new user. To get a single user, the route would be slash API slash users slash, and then the user's ID as a route parameter. Um, there's also rules about REST APIs that cover the statefulness of the API. If you make a request to the API and then you make a subsequent request, the second request should not know anything about the first request that you made unless you provided the information in the request. Um, so REST APIs are kind of the golden standard for APIs. There's also SOAP, um, but... Yeah, it's a, it's a specific type of API. It's a specific structure that is used. Um, are there JavaScript frameworks that make APIs easier? Yes. Uh, well, so, so it depends on what you mean by make APIs easier. If you mean making the API themselves, yes. There is uh, a, arguably, it's one of the most common web frame, web ser server-side web frameworks, period, not even just in JavaScript, called Express. And that's what we teach at the in the full stack web development program. Um, as far as uh, making API calls from the front end, um, fetch is you can do 
any, you can make any kind of request using fetch, but some of the non-traditional, you know, if you have to make a post request to send information to the server, like to, to create new information on the, in the database or something like that, um, fetch is a little clunky. So um, somebody had mentioned it, we didn't end up getting time to get into it, but there is a very commonly used uh, JavaScript library called Axios that is used to um, send requests in a more, it's, it's a more robust uh, set of functionality for making uh, network calls. Um, and then that's another great question. Khadija asked, what happens if we use an API, but the API is later made private or removed entirely? Unfortunately, you gotta figure something else out. Uh, if you're using an API and it just ceases to exist, then it's time to build it yourself or find an alternative and reconfigure everything. Now, generally, publicly available APIs don't just disappear from existence without notice. Uh, if they're going to shut down, they'll let you know. So you'll have some time to find an alternative. Um, but I can't, I, I can't think of a single API that I've ever touched that does not still exist. So, cool. Well, right. that, yeah. So that's all the time we have for today. Um, I mentioned in the chat earlier that um, you will all receive a recording. If you signed up uh, for the event, you'll receive a uh, recording of the event via your email at some point tomorrow. Uh, it's usually 24 hours after um, I drop my email in the chat I can drop it again one last time if you guys want to go ahead and save it if you have any questions for me or if you just want to connect with me to get started on your Kenzie journey so it was great uh, seeing you all today Cody love the Pokemon presentation so you guys you have a good night stay safe okay everybody thanks for coming thanks for watching thanks for spending your evening with us hopefully I'll see you in class soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>